Damaged Defenders by Sherza. Chapter 48 Frigga, Farbati, and Loki. Part 1. In the end, Frigga was unable to convince Farbati to not go to Midgard. She didn't even really blame Farbati for their insistence. Had it been her, she'd have insisted on going immediately as well, regardless of whether it was a good idea or not. Frigga was, however, able to argue that they wait for the next day. By the time Frigga had finished telling Farbati everything, it had been fairly late, and while staying overnight might still end up happening despite heading for Midgard first thing in the morning, they at least wouldn't be causing a mad scramble by showing up only a few hours before overnight lodgings would be required. There ended up being quite a... discussion between Farbati, Helblindi, and Bilestair. Both Hilblindy and Bilestair wanted to meet their youngest sibling. Fortunately, Farbani was able to convince them to wait for another time. The situation was going to be fraught enough with just Farbati there. Adding the two siblings would complicate things. The next morning, Frigga, Sif, the three, and Farbati headed back to the abandoned, destroyed city, and Frigga called for Heimdall. Heimdall, if you please... They transferred to Asgard first, where they dropped Seif and the three off, despite their desire to go to Midgard. As with having Hill, Blindy, and Bilestair there, having Seif and the three present when Farbati and Logi met was going to complicate things massively, and Frigga had put her foot down. They would not be going. From there, Frigga and Farbati transferred to Midgard, landing on the roof of Stark Tower. Farbati was incredibly nervous. Not that they would admit it to anyone. Well, nervous, incredibly upset, and rather thoroughly enraged, among other things, but the nerves were taking precedence at the moment. Unlike their spouse, Farbati had never been off Jotunheim before. That they were doing so now in the company of the Queen of Asgard was more than a little unnerving. The view Farbati got of Midgard did not help all that much. Climbing a mountain aside, and that was an entirely different affair. They had never been this high up before. Insofar as they knew, not even the Asgardian palace was this tall. And there were more structures as far as the eye could see. Some taller than this one, others the same height or shorter. By the void, if these structures were where the Midgardians lived, just how many of them were there? The potential numbers were almost beyond Farbati's comprehension. There had been so few Jotuns for so long that their current living conditions, with perhaps a few hundred of them gathered in one place, seemed crowded to Farbati. The idea of having so large a population as to be required to build structures like this to accommodate them all boggled their mind. A few moments after they arrived, so too did several beings, only one of whom Farbati knew. Thor. One of the other two was clad in some sort of metal armor. Or was that the being itself? Farbati had no idea. That was red and gold. It, like Thor, flew to the roof from somewhere else, though its method was far different than Thor's. With the metal and gold being was a being that looked not unlike an Aesir, though somewhat shorter and less muscular. Mother, Thor asked, focusing on Frigga. All is well, my son. Farbati wished to meet. That was as far as Frigga got before several other beings arrived. Again, all bore a passing resemblance to the Aesir, though shorter and not as muscular, though one of their company came remarkably close, being nearly identical to Thor in all respects to Farbati's eyes. Several of them had weapons in evidence. Farbati went very still. Beside her, Frigga made an amused noise. As I was saying, all is well. I wish Frigga started again. She never did get to introduce Farbati properly because at that point, Loki arrived. And the first thing he did was throw a fireball in Farbati's face. In the end, Farbati was fortunate that the rest of the Avengers got to the roof first. If Loki had gotten there first, there would have been a major problem. Luckily, Loki had been in his quarters when Frigga and Farbati arrived, and Jarvis had had the wit to forewarn the rest of the Avengers first, then Loki. Mr. Ferguson, your mother is on the roof. Jarvis told Loki, in the company of a tall, blue-skinned... That was as far as Jarvis got. 
Loki had glanced up from the book he was reading when Jarvis started talking and had immediately put the book down when Frigga's presence was announced, the start of a happy smile twitching at the corners of his mouth. That happiness, however, turned to blind rage at the partial identification of her companion. Loki was firmly in the denial stage of dealing with the stuff that had poured down over his head over the last year or so at the moment. He was pretending as best he could that there wasn't a problem, that everything was fine. Sure, he'd had the nightmare that one time. The fact he hadn't slept since then was pure coincidence. He had a lot to do and not a lot of time to do it in, after all. He'd get around to sleeping again, eventually, when he felt like it. And that was where he was at, with dealing with his fall and Thanos and what had happened to him in Thanos' keeping. The Jotun issue? Loki was determinedly pretending that didn't exist at all, while still thinking of himself, for the most part, as a monster, etc. The whole thing had just been waiting for a spark to set off some epic fireworks. Frigga showing up with any Jotun was more like tossing a Molotov cocktail into a lake of gasoline. Loki instantaneously assumed the worst. After all, Jotuns were monsters, and it was not beyond the realm of possibility for such a base being to somehow get their hands on Frigga. Loki's response was instantaneous. He teleported to the roof between the gathered Avengers and his mother and the Jotun, and flung a fireball in its face, sparing just enough concentration and effort to ensure the fireball didn't so much as warm Frigga in the process, never mind burn her. Given how easily magic in general had come to Loki, he'd always wondered why fire spells had been so difficult for him to master. He had finally chalked it up to the fact that no magician could be equally good at everything to do with magic. He worked all the harder to master them. Now, of course, he knew the truth of the matter. During the battle with the Jatari, Loki had been doing what he could to conserve his strength, as he'd had no way of knowing how long the battle was going to last. Flimsy short-term illusions... The sort of magic he could perform in his sleep had been the easiest way to fight so many for an undetermined length of time. He wasn't holding back now. He put his back into that fireball for all it hadn't been permitted to singe Frigga. The blast melted some of the roof and caught more on fire, and Loki sent a second fireball almost before the first had left his fingers. It was only a Jotun's instinctive response to danger that kept her body from being very badly hurt. Pure instinct had them icing up, not just their arm as most Jotun warriors did in a fight with their entire body. The first fireball hit that ice, which melted away under the assault for body still got singed, but nowhere near as badly as they would have otherwise. They managed to get a protective ice wall up between the first and second fireball. Loki was snarling in rage, spewing vitriol and epithets as he hammered at Farbody's constantly reforming ice wall with fireball after fireball. He was deaf to the Avengers' alarmed cries and attempts to get him to calm down. Or he was until three people did some very stupid things. Steve, shield up, jumped between Loki and Farbody's ice wall. Roughly at the same time, Frigga recovered from her shock and the viciousness of Loki's attack and put herself between Loki and his target, a protective shield shimmering into being around herself, Steve, and Farbody. Steve didn't lower his shield despite the magical one going up. At the same time, Thor, the only one with a prayer of physically restraining Loki other than the Hulk, got Loki in a bear hug from behind. He actually lifted Loki off his feet in an attempt to either spoil Loki's aim, break his concentration, or better yet, both. Frigga's shield still got nailed with one vicious fireball before the next went skyward thanks to Thor taking Loki off his feet. Loki bellowed in rage and writhed, slamming his head back in an attempt to headbutt Thor, then writhed violently in a desperate attempt to get free. Loki called Thor every name in the book, and then some accused him of cowardice and worse in his attempts to get free. The bastard refused to loosen his hold. When Loki kept fighting, Thor finally resorted to body slamming Loki onto the roof and then planting Mjolnir on his chest. Loki shrieked in rage because while there had been the possibility of him getting out of Thor's grasp, Mjolnir was an entirely different matter. Worse, Thor took advantage of having his hand free to grab Loki's wrists and pin them to the roof, preventing Loki from working any further magic. It took a good 10 or 15 minutes for Loki to calm down enough to even begin to think and to stop physically flailing around. Even at that, it couldn't be called an improvement because where before Loki had just been spewing whatever came to mind, now he was calm enough to focus and aim his verbal attacks. Get your hammer off me, Thor, Loki demanded. 
for it. Sadly, wasn't going for it. I think not, brother, nor will I lose your hands. Interestingly, however, Thor made no attempt to silence Loki. Loki would think about the implications of that later. Much, much later. So be it. Loki had worked with worse circumstances when it came to flaying someone alive verbally. He gave a harsh, mugging laugh that had nothing of humor in it. How sweet. Loki fairly burned in a venomous, slightly unhinged tone of voice that probably had everyone's ankles rising instinctively. It was not a comforting sound. The beast that bore the monster come to see the get it abandoned in the snow to die. How touching. Do tell me, when did I become of interest to you, before or after I slew Laufey? Or was it that I attempted to destroy Jotunheim that made me worth claiming? Are you proud of all the death I've wrought, or was it not enough blood to sate you? My child, Farbadi started. It was a mistake. I am not your child! Loki shrieked, abruptly writhing in Thor's grasp again, trying desperately to get out from under Mjolnir, despite knowing it was impossible. You and your precious king left me to die! Farbadi, though, was having none of it. They bellowed right back. Who did not? Then, more quietly, Jotunheim is a harsh realm, Loki. Those born small or with infirmities tend to die in horrible ways. Long ago, it became our way to test such children to see if they could survive, and to spare those that could not a lingering, possibly quite painful death. You were undergoing that test when the child thief stole you from us. The temple was thrashed and the priests slaughtered. When your body was not found, we thought... You lost to one of the predators or scavengers that roamed the realm and grieved your passing. Loki gave a harsh laugh. I am the god of lies, beast. If you think to do me with your tail, you are sorely mistaken. Then he gave Thor a positively evil glare. Let me up, or I will destroy the roof to get out from under this blasted hammer. Thor must have seen the truth of it in Loki's eyes because he reluctantly lifted Mjolnir clear of Loki. Loki scrambled to his feet, for once eschewing grace in his desire to just get out of there as fast as possible. He leveled a vicious glare at Varbati. Never poison this realm with your presence again, he snarled. I will not hesitate to kill you do I see you again. Loki immediately teleported out. He wasn't in the mood to hang about and find out how the Avengers were going to react to his laws of control. Experience had taught him that regardless of whatever goading he had endured, he would be seen to be at fault for lashing out. He gritted his teeth angrily. So much for this, then. He should have known better. Should have known something would happen to ruin it. With a sigh, he started packing. He didn't get very far before, to his shock, Darcy arrived. She blinked when she saw him packing. So, where are you going? She asked. It hardly matters, does it? The Avengers will not tolerate my presence after this. Loki said. Darcy actually laughed. Dude, right now? They're up on the roof pitching Frigga and this map out. I thought Tony was going to blow a blood vessel. Bruce was looking more than a little green around the gills. And Steve looks like he wanted to smack someone over the head with his shield. And it wasn't you we wanted to hit either. And that was just in the minute or so before I came after you. They're probably two inches from starting World War Three up there by now. Nobody's mad at you. Well, okay, Tony might be a bit miffed at you setting a jug of the roof on fire, but he gets that it wasn't what you were trying to do. Loki blinked at her in surprise. They're not blaming me? No, Darcy said. They're all on Frigga and the Smurf. I mean, we all know you've got some heavy-duty shit you've had happen to you, and that you're kind of avoiding dealing with it, which is completely understandable given what we know of what's going on. That it's a lot. And forcing you to confront any part of it before you were ready, and without a warning so you can brace yourself, is pretty uncool. Darcy walked over and put a hand on his arm. I know you're not used to people having your back when shit goes down, but we're never going to just automatically think everything is all your fault. She shot a look around his room. So you don't have to do a runner, all right? We're not mad at you, and we're not going to take it out on you. Though I kind of have to say, those fireballs, bad ass. 
Loki made an amused noise as some of his anger and irritation fled. You are an unusual being, Darcy, he said. Some part of him unclenched just a little bit. He didn't quite believe her. After a millennium of basically being the designated whipping boy, trusting in anyone's good nature wasn't going to come easily. He had to admit that the Avengers had yet to play him false, though, despite having more than ample reason to do so, given his actions in this realm. Darcy grinned at him. You better bet I am. Come on, I'm going to take you out for some retail therapy. Get your mind off of, well, stuff, and give the gang a chance to shoo unwanted visitors away. Retail therapy, Loki wanted to know. Otherwise known as shopping. I know you packed your stuff when you left Asgard, but I figure you're going to need some stuff only available here. Like a phone, something to play tunes on when you're not in the tower or on the common floors and don't want to bug people with your music. Some books, stuff like that. That sounded practical, and it would get him away from the tower until they were gone and give him a chance to regain his equilibrium. Very well then, Darcy. Lead the way.